talk about perspectives. These images may or may not be new to you, but take a look. Do you see an old lady or a young woman? Can you see both? Is this a rabbit or a duck? Two faces or a vase? Of course, with these optical illusions, both things are true. I'd like to offer, now it depends on your perspective, how you look at them. I'd like to offer that learning differences may be similar to these optical illusions. It is generally true that having a learning difference makes school and life more difficult. It may be less obvious, but also true that there's beauty and value in those differences. It depends on our perspective, on how we perceive neurodiversity. For students, many students who have learning challenges, school is far more difficult than it should be. They are rarely recognized for their strengths, and they have to work tirelessly to overcome not only their learning challenges, but also our school culture, our educational school culture. We tend to value students who can learn really quickly and sit up straight and write neatly. These parameters are much too limiting and it should be reconsidered. When we instead appreciate the different ways people learn and experience the world, everyone benefits. As educators, we haven't always had valid information about how the brain works or about learning challenges, but the research that is available today should enlighten us and help us to empower every student who walks through our doors. Still, when I look at what actually happens in our schools, it seems we often fall short of that ideal. We allow students to come in, but we don't always embrace them for who they are and how they learn. Far too frequently, students who have learning challenges face obstacles that are unnecessary. Let's consider an analogy. How many of you out there wear glasses or contacts? Several years ago, I realized I was having a challenge with my own learning. My eyes didn't seem to be working the way they should. The road signs were getting harder and harder to read, and the fine print was getting finer and finer. I decided I needed to visit a professional who would be able to help me figure out what was going on and what we could do about it. The optometrist did a thorough eye exam using the latest technology, and he determined that I did, in fact, have some issues with my vision. He recommended that I have eyeglasses made, specifically for me, based on what he found in his evaluation. The, pro the, the discovery of other kinds of learning challenges is pretty similar. Somewhere along the way, a student, parent, or teacher decides that maybe something isn't going quite right with the educational journey. A formal evaluation is sought from a psychologist or neurologist or other highly qualified professional. These evaluations take hours and they look at many aspects of how a student learns. They're performed by experts who have spent years learning what to look for and how to help students who struggle. From there, a diagnosis is made and accommodations are recommended. No one has ever tried to tell me that my classes give me an unfair advantage over people who don't have issues with their vision. Nor has anyone ever tried to suggest that I don't really need my glasses, that maybe the optometrist made a mistake, or that I was faking my vision issues. People rarely ask if they can use my glasses. This pair was made specifically for me, for my vision profile. And they would likely not help most other people, even once you have vision issues. Think about those of us who wear glasses. They don't give us superpowers. We can't see through walls or into the future. They just try and help us be able to see about as well as people who don't have any issues with their vision. 
Similarly, academic accommodations try to provide that kind of playing field, to level the playing field for students who have learning differences. They don't provide any unfair advantages, and they're based strictly on the findings of the formal evaluation that's done by an expert. They don't give anyone an unfair chance or superpowers. While we still aren't sure exactly what causes these learning challenges, a lot of research has been done recently. We do know, clearly at this point, that the brains of people who have dyslexia and ADHD, they develop and function differently, and they are anatomically different than the brains of others. One study recently showed the, brains, the, the areas of the brain that are activated during reading. Image A shows us the brain scan of a person who does not have dyslexia when they're reading. Image B shows the scan of someone who does have dyslexia. And image C lights up the area that is less activated in a person who has dyslexia. This and many other research studies clearly show that dyslexia and ADHD and other learning challenges are not due to a lack of intelligence or effort, but instead are biologically based. As we continue to learn more, we do know that we can support students well when they have these kinds of learning challenges. When schools approach learning challenges as laziness or inability, <coughs> students far too often buy into those myths. When schools instead approach learning challenges as a different way to learn, students often succeed. I've had the opportunity to be an educator for a long time. Most of those years, I've spent working with students who have diagnosed learning disabilities. I've seen the progress that students can make even when they've really struggled. And I'd like to share just a few of those experiences. Josh came with his family when he was eight years old to St. Louis, Missouri from Columbia. He was learning English and he also has significant ADHD. His whole journey through school was quite difficult, but he mastered English and was given lots of tools to help him compensate for his attention issues. Recently, he earned his MBA, and he's now working in his chosen field of finance. He reports that having to think creatively to solve problems in multiple ways from a young age has helped him not only through school, but now as an adult. He also says that he's learned compassion as everyone faces some kind of obstacle that gets in the way of their success. Anna has a language processing disorder that made school, and particularly writing papers, almost overwhelming. During middle school, she was taught strategies and given tools to be able to structure her thinking so she could get her thoughts on paper well. And after years of practice through high school and into college, she's become a really strong writer. She graduated last year, and she's now putting her passion for art to work professionally. She says that those strategies that she learned to overcome her language processing issues now help her succeed in her career. My friend Tony Bridwell went all through school and until he was a senior didn't realize that he had dyslexia. Being introduced to tech tools like books on tape helped him to overcome those issues and to finish his education. He's now a well-known speaker and author of several books. He says that he learned to overcome these, these issues by, by working really hard and doing the best he could. So if we look across lots of different fields, we find highly successful people who have diagnosed learning disabilities. For example, the CEOs of each of these companies has a diagnosed learning difference, as do lots of celebrities, including these and many others. Our current California governor, Gavin Newsom, was diagnosed with dyslexia when he was five. He reports that school was hard for him, but now his dyslexia helps him to retain what he reads 
and to think on his feet. This is a refrain I hear often from adults who have learning challenges and who've been through our educational system. They talk about learning resilience and tenacity despite all the difficulties. It's estimated that about 13% of all students have some form of learning disability. We now know so much more about how to support all kinds of learners well. Wouldn't it be better if we built schools that offered support and helped people learn those character traits that we want them to have through positive experiences rather than by having to overcome obstacles? So although we, have, we know a lot more about how to help students who learn differently, um, there's some other things that have been developed, some other teaching tools and methods that have been developed based on our work with students who learn differently that benefit all kinds of learners. Unlike accommodations, these tools and methods can be used to benefit every student who comes in our doors. I'd like to offer some ideas for schools and teachers to consider. We should teach study strategies to all students. No one comes into school knowing how to take good notes or manage their time well or memorize things. But these and other strategies that lead to strong learning can be taught. Computers are great. Pen and paper are great. Each of these tools has their best used purposes. It's important that we make sure our students understand when to use each of these tools to maximize their efficiency. Flexible seating should be available to students so that they can find the arrangement that works best for them. Audio books and other multi-sensory inputs are great for all kinds of brains. Timing tests leads to anxiety for many students. Let's allow students to show us what they know without limiting the time, at least within reason. The more we can make our teaching authentic and engaging, rather than about dispensing facts and formulas, the more all students benefit. We should steer clear of teaching anything that is Googleable. Collaboration skills also can be directly taught. Students don't know how to work together in a group, but these skills can be structured and taught well. Learning to read is not magic. It is imperative that we use research-based methods to teach young children to read. All learning is emotional. It is also important that teachers develop meaningful relationships with each of their students. These and other educational shifts would benefit students who have learning challenges, but they wouldn't limit any students. In fact, every student would benefit from these kinds of changes. We know that employers today are looking for creativity, good communication skills, critical thinking, and the ability to collaborate well. The shift in education to appreciate neurodiversity would allow these and other important skills to be a part of the, of the school journey for all kinds of students. It's important that we as teachers seek to figure out why our students struggle and to help them find the tools they need to overcome those struggles. What looks like lack of effort, or a bad attitude, or inability, may instead stem from a learning difference, diagnosed or not. As educators, we should seek to be curious rather than accusatory. We should investigate rather than judge. We should use proven methods to make sure that all of our students thrive. Every student comes to us with strengths and challenges. Neurodiversity is part of the human condition and should be appreciated. Let's think back to our optical illusions. Can you see the old lady looking down and to the left and the young lady facing away from us with a feather in her hand? 
the rabbit and the duck, the two faces, and the vase. A shift in perspectives helps you to see both truths in each of these images. Similarly, a shift in our understanding of neurodiversity <coughs> is in order. We need to appreciate every student who comes in our doors as they are valuable to not only our schools, but to the world. We need to provide the best opportunities to help everyone succeed to the best of their ability. As my friends at the Epstein School so beautifully <coughs> say, each person, within each person, there is a spark of something transcendent and positive. It's in that spark that we find the things that are different, special, and uniquely talented about each one of us. How can you help people, everyone, make that spark, even for people who have learning challenges, into a bright light that will benefit the whole world? Thank you.